Hello, and welcome to the World Water Week Communication Accelerator on Science Communication. The Communication Accelerator is a special program focusing on the pivotal role communication plays in societal transformation. And in this episode, we'd like to highlight the importance of making complex issues such as water and climate change comprehensible and relevant for non-scholarly audiences. Research-based knowledge is obviously an important part of policy making to achieve the fulfilment of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. But it is often a huge challenge in today's media landscape to make science relevant to a wider audience. So how do we bridge that widening gap between science and society? How do we counter fake news with science and facts? And let's also take a closer look at effective methods and best practices when it comes to communicating science. I'd like to take a moment to thank the Grundfos Foundation for their support and making this discussion possible. My name is Malcolm Larry, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's panel discussion. And joining me on this panel is Johannes Ernstberger, Engagement Officer at Stockholm Resilience Centre, who's joining us from Stockholm. Jeffrey Kamadi, award-winning science journalist, joining us from Nairobi. Marina Jobert, science communication researcher at Stellenbosch University, joining us from Hamburg today. And Rebecca Ilunga, Senior Manager for Water Security at C40, who's joining us from Cape Town today. So thank you all for being here. It's great and warm welcome to you all. An opening question to all of the panelists. What are the biggest challenges to science communication? And how do we reach a broad audience when communicating a complex issue? And Marina, would you please take the first answer on this? Thank you so much, Malcolm. I'm going to try to answer very briefly in three ways. Firstly, I think that scientists should really try to integrate public communication and engagement as a natural part of the research cycle. In other words, don't think of communicating with public audiences as something extra, but rather see it as a value-adding activity that will add impact to your research. And that means you have to plan for it and importantly budget for it in the same way and at the same time when you plan your research. And then you use the milestones in your research as springboards for public and policy communication. For example, when you get a major grant, when you form a new collaboration, when you publish a journal article, when you speak at a major conference, these are all excellent starting points for wider communication and public engagement. But importantly, don't try to do it all on your own. I mean, scientists are under extreme pressure of time. And so when you've planned for communication and you've budgeted for it, you can get help. Make friends with your institutional science communicators. They are key partners, but also budget to get help from specialist communicators such as editors, videographers, illustrators and other media specialists. That can really make a huge difference. So you have to be proactive and reactive, you know, respond to opportunities as they come along, but also be proactive. Secondly, I really believe that scientists need to become more strategic about their public engagement. In other words, be very clear about what it is exactly that you're setting out to achieve. And here I would advise to forget about broad awareness raising amongst the general public. That is far too vague. You need to be far more specific and pin down measurable and achievable goals. And these goals will then determine exactly the audiences that you engage with, how best to frame your messages, which communication tactics will work best, which tools you're going to use. Without clear goals, your efforts can easily become scattered and diluted. But with clear and measurable goals, you can really make a difference and keep track of what you achieve. And that's very important for future efforts and for sustaining your communication efforts. And then lastly, but not um, least important, very importantly, is I think we need to recognize the complexity of communicating science with diverse public and policy audiences. We know that people respond very differently to new information, depending on their context, their cultures, their prior views, and a host of other factors. And therefore, changing opinion or affecting policy change or changing behaviors can be extremely challenging. And that is why I advise people to take note of new and emerging insights from a broad field that is widely known as the science of science communication. 
and especially natural scientists working in water and climate change and related fields, I advise them strongly to form partnership with social scientists in fields such as social psychology and behavioral science and communication science, because they can help you to navigate these tricky waters towards what we call evidence-based science communication strategies. The bottom line is if you rely on your gut, you may waste time and resources and your communication efforts may even backfire. Today, we know that you need to use science if you want to communicate science effectively. Great. So a science-based approach to science communication. I love it. So, uh, Jeffrey, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, so the main challenge of uh, getting information on science has been uh, the accessibility of uh, scientists, for example. Uh, but then uh, uh, nowadays there are a lot of networks uh, of science communicators and science journalists that is really helping journalists to get uh, information, even if when uh, we don't have uh, uh, the scientists uh, to speak to here in Kenya, you can uh, get other experts from uh, around around the world comment on a subject of science that you are writing about. Uh, but then uh, when writing about science issues, uh, we know that it's a very technical subject. So it is always important to read widely. And uh, once you get the comments from uh, the scientists, uh, let them explain to you uh, in a very simple way about uh, the subject so that uh, you are able to communicate effectively uh, to your audience. So basically, you need to understand uh, very well the subject uh, so that uh, you are able to, to communicate to your audience. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it's a very you know common uh, thought about intellectuals and, uh, and great teachers is that they make the complex simple. Uh, Rebecca, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I think I would really like to answer it in two parts. The first is really much around the challenge that we have. And Marina touched on it so greatly around building partnerships. I think it's really important to break silos between academia, governance, and the private sector, and really look at embracing transdisciplinarity. Um, and then I think the second thing is in science, we're often trying to solve a very wicked problem, which by definition is complex in nature. And so we're really looking to create a narrative um, where cause and effect isn't always direct and immediate. So how do we really go around reaching a broader audience and communicating a complex issue? The one solution I think is around telling the impact story at varying scales, and that's really important. So what does it look like on the ground, whether it's at a national or a local level, and bring communities on board to make sure that we're actually answering the right questions? And then the second is around how we reach a broad audience of, is finding a nexus of the evidence and the political and social context and the links between the policy and the science communities. So whether that's through networks, whether it's through competing discourses, or whether it involves building trust with the communities that we're trying to disseminate the information with. Yeah, fantastic answer. And you're actually, uh, you know, reflecting a lot of thoughts that were presented in the representation communication accelerator um, as well. So, Johannes, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, there's three things that come to mind um, for me. One is the, the complex, complexity of science and the world. And I mean, Rebecca, you've touched upon this. this is, uh, these are wicked, um, wicked issues. Uh, the second is the famous preaching choir. Um, and for the third one, I would say it's a, a positive attitude. Um, if we start with the complexity, well, one issue is that people and our audience, they don't want to feel stupid. Um, and unfortunately, science is quite complex and complicated. The world is, uh, in a way, and the challenges we try to communicate. Um, and then, I mean, breaking, down, breaking things down becomes a solution. But it's with a risk, because if we oversimplify, we lose our credibility um, as scientists. And I think that's probably what we have to be most most careful with. Um, on the other hand, if we don't simplify, we will not be able to reach wider audiences. So this becomes a, a matter of a quite delicate balance. Um, then if you're, if you're uh, looking at the, the, the preaching choir, I mean, 
people they like to hear what they already know and that's an uh, established concept and we also like to communicate to people that agree with us uh, quite obviously understandably um but in that way we tend to get locked into bubbles of audiences that already are aware of the challenges we want to communicate around. Uh, we preach to the choir and we need to find ways to go beyond that. Um, and then, I mean, in the same way that people don't want to feel stupid, they don't want to feel guilty and they don't want to feel hopeless. Uh, and a lot of our science communication today, I think, focuses on all the things that go wrong. Uh, the Amazon is dying, biodiversity collapsing, climate change is beyond an irre irreversible point, and people start to become paralyzed and apathetic. Uh, and we need to give them hope and the feeling that they have the power to change the world. Uh, this doesn't mean that we should tell people that everything is fine, because everything is not fine. Uh, and when Greta Thunberg family famously says that our house is on fire, she is right. Um, but we, as the scientific community, need to tell people, look, Here's a fire extinguisher. This is how we can create a fire blanket. There are possibilities of reversing the damage. Yeah, wonderful. And, uh, you know, Hans Rosling did such a good job with his work in communicating what was working with science and what is actually going right to make sure people don't give in to that rust of cynicism. Uh, Marina, I'd like to direct a question to you, if I can. As a senior researcher in the field of science communication, how can scientists be more successful in reaching out to communities, policymakers, and other audiences, especially around these issues of water, nature, and climate? Well, I think to to add to what I've already said, you know, about being strategic and about forming these partnerships, about getting help, and um, I think we. We also have seen in the in the last two years, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic as well, you know, I've been particularly interested to look at scientists that have been especially successful at becoming visible and becoming trusted public advisors. And I asked myself, you know, what can we learn from their communication style and tactics? And what was it about their way of communicating that made them popular with the media and that, that made them popular with the public as well, and even with, with politicians as trusted advisors? And I think there are a few um, key lessons that we can take um, and, you know, that scientists can take to heart in, in terms of going forward. And I think the first one for me is that the mass media remains a key partner if you wish to influence public and policy opinion. Um, so influential scientists are media friendly. They make time for the media. They will even go out of their way to accommodate media requests. Um, and social media and, and other things, of course, are, are important too, but we've seen the power of the mass media repeatedly again in, in the last two years. And then when you speak to public audiences, you should not be afraid to, to make it personal, to, to, to show the human being behind the science, to show your own um, emotions and fears and concerns and expectations and hopes for the future. We see that these very influential scientists use stories, and they share personal anecdotes, and importantly, they avoid jargon. They, they invest time and effort to learn how to speak and to clear things up, not to oversimplify, but to, to use techniques that make things clear and meaningful and relevant to their audiences. They don't hesitate to include their own feelings and concerns and express empathy. They create those emotional connections with their audience. It's really, really important to build trust. They openly admit when there's uncertainty and they will explain why they're not able to provide some answers yet. And that's another proven way to build trust. So they don't only talk about the science, but also the process of science and why we sometimes are not able to give advice yet. And I think lastly, but very importantly, is we see that scientists that are successful in engaging with public and policy audiences have institutional backup and support. They have some protection, they have help. And I think that is also key because there are risks involved in going public. We should not deny that. That's why you should plan it and, and you should get expert help. But it also takes time. And that's why the institutional support and recognition and reward for public communication is so important. Can I just ask a question regarding, you know, your opening statement? You talked about the importance of, you know, really communicating at every milestone you hit. Why do you think that's so important? Can you just elucidate on that a little bit, please? Right. We often see that scientists think about public communication as something that comes at the end of a research project. Um, and by then you've missed many opportunities for um, communication. Um, there are wonderful opportunities along the way. People are interested in the adventure of science, the, 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 the questions you're setting out to answer. 
also, if you plan ahead, you know that you will plan to capture the visuals and to get comments from people along the way. If you only start thinking about communication at the end of a project, you've, you've missed so many opportunities already. And, and it's re it really requires you to think ahead at the beginning of a research project, at the conceptual stage, what will be the milestones and, and when will I be able to engage? And it also, of course, is key in public engagement. There may be communities and specific journalists and policymakers that you want to engage along the way. They don't want to hear about your project five years later when it's all done and dusted. They want to be part. They want to have co-ownership. It creates opportunities for community engagement, for sharing knowledge, for allowing people to be a part of that knowledge creation and co-ownership of the, of the project. And that is also a way to build trust. So we are we are really beyond the stage where we want to think of communication at the end of a project. It should be there from the start, right through every stage of the project, and it should be become a natural part of being a scientist um, and take yeah. people along with you on the journey. And don't you know wait until you've published a peer review paper. That's far too late. And of course, communicating those milestones all give you also gives you the opportunity to gather more interested stakeholders yeah. who are discovering your work and who can benefit from it. Exactly. Jeff Jeffrey, thank you so much. Uh, um, I would really appreciate your answer. Jeffrey, as an award-winning science journalist, can you please tell us what you think the common pitfalls to avoid are when communicating complex reports and research? Uh, first of all, um, I will uh, go back to what I had said in earlier. Uh, you need to understand the subject uh, very well. Uh, you need to get uh, the scientists to, to explain to you uh, the subject uh, clearly and so that uh, you can communicate uh, very clearly to your, to your audiences. Uh, but um, one of the major pitfalls that uh, scientists, uh, 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 science journalists uh, can avoid is to, you know, assume about a subject uh, that you're writing. Uh, you might know uh, something, yes, but uh, you need to, uh, uh, to get uh, a clear uh, explanation from the scientists. But also you need to, to, to read widely about the subject so that you can be able to communicate it uh, very well. So reading also is a, is a very key uh, component of communicating uh, science uh, subject very well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Uh, you know, uh, Rebecca, you've been working across sub-Saharan Africa in your role as a water security manager, and I'm really curious what country-specific factors need to be taken into account when sharing science in different places, and, and what have you learnt about this from your work? Thanks so much for the question. Um, I think there's a lot of things to consider when we're looking to influence policy and incorporate science to ensure that the decision-making processes that are made from that science are very much data-driven and that that data is actually available within the country um, to influence the science as well. So the one thing that I really learned in Sub-Saharan Africa, and I think it even applies globally, is prioritizing co-exploration and co-production of knowledge. Um, it leads to better management of the solutions and it leads to better knowledge integration if the process, as everyone has touched on, is actually developed with the people within the communities. The second thing I think is really important is around um, having a better understanding of the climate impacts, their drivers and the systemic impact. So a lot of the work that I've done has had a climate lens. So how do we really look at fostering context specific yet transferable learnings? Although it is developed for a very specific context, how can this be applied in other cities or other countries? Um, the third thing is around understanding what mechanisms exist. So some of the work that I've done has looked at different models, whether it's having city advisors that are actually within the city to embed some of the scientific information that's developed or um, having embedded researchers. So those are people actually within the city that understand how the city or the community work and are able to speak more clearly to the science that is being developed, bringing in the context that they're in. 
And then often, I think Jeffrey touched on this around the assumptions is often developing the science alone is not enough. Um, so in some of the work that we've done at C40 in partnership with Grunfuss around water safe cities, you know, we had a city advisory group where we actually double checked what we were doing. Are we answering the right questions? Part of the problem is that uh, many people have a very narrow definition of how science can influence policy and decision making, essentially sometimes only focusing on the legislation component or the regulation component. Um, but we really need to think about how it could be more broadly incorporated into strategies and how it could influence behaviors and attitudes as well. Um, so we've seen that with some of the cities that we've worked with, for example, Freetown, they're really looking at implementing a great project called Freetown the Tree Town, um, which is an innovative approach to greening the city using digital tools. Um, and they've kind of developed a brand new way of doing it that very much suits their context and really brings the residents on board to take. Rebecca, we lost you just for your, your last comment there. But let me jump across to Johannes. Johannes, uh, with your work at the Resilience Centre, you're focused on ensuring you have press engagement and visibility on social media. So what adjustments do you make when using social media as a communication tool? And, you know, one of the things that comes to mind for me immediately is attention span, because I read yesterday that the most watched TikTok videos, which is the most popular social media platform right now, are just 15 to 30 seconds long. So we have a really complex challenge here. So tell me, how do you handle that? Yeah, I mean, that is a challenge. And uh, to be honest, uh, 15, to seconds, 15 to 30 seconds of video is, is quite good, actually, for social media, because most <laughs> people will scroll past your post in less than a second. Um, if they get stuck, they usually uh, they look at it for a couple of seconds. Uh, and um, I mean, of course, that's a, that's a huge challenge. Um, you need to catch your audience's attention instantly. Uh, and you're competing against what, essentially? I mean, videos of cute cats. Uh, it's a tough competition. Um, but, I mean, if you look at it, actually, those type of cat videos can be some sort of inspiration. Um, because what they, the reason they're so popular is that um, they talk to your emotions. Uh, and that's exactly what science communication needs to do, too. Uh, and um, if you're looking at that, I mean, what, what kind of emotions are the ones that are driving engagement on social media. And um, awe is the best. Laughter is next best. Uh, feeling inspired is good too. Uh, generally, positive feelings perform much better on social media than negative ones. Um, with sort of an exception, uh, anger can work quite good as, a, as an engagement feeling, but I would not recommend, it use, you recommend using it a lot. Um, and if you're looking back at the best one, awe, it's an excellent emotion for science communications. If you can teach your audience something new, and if you can make, make it all inspiring, you basically hit the home run already there. Um, and what's really interesting is both you and Marina have talked about the necessity for emotion in the communication. And one of the reasons that I think scientists can get together and talk about extremely complex things is because when they're talking about it, they're having an emotional response to the data that a, a person in the general public cannot. And so just from your experience, Johannes, what, what are some of the things that you've tried and that you've seen succeed? Um, I mean, generally, and I, I touched upon that uh, already in the, in the beginning, mm. um, if you can frame things so they give hope, um, they are much more engaging. Um, also, it feels much nicer to communicate something which which actually is hopeful in a way. And and not all all science news, but quite some science news actually you can reframe. You can say that we have identified this challenge, but we also have identified this possible solution. Um, and I think that's something which which is working quite quite well for us at uh, Stockholm Resilience Center, um, as far as I can see it. Um, and I think it it might be working quite well for many others as well. Um, Great. Malcolm, yeah. if I may. Yes, you and may. It's interesting that you pick up on, you know, the mention of emotion because I think we, we know that for scientists, um, especially natural scientists, sometimes they may be a little bit uh, scared or uncertain about using emotions and, and how to do it. And um, But it is, we have now a solid body of evidence 
showing how important it is to make those emotional connections with with audiences. Actually, Randy Olson, one of my uh, author that I really like, had written about science storytelling. He gives the definition of a story as facts that are wrapped in emotions. Mm. And I think what I like about that is the facts are still important. The facts should be there. We should communicate facts. We should give people information. But we need to wrap it in some sort of layer of emotions to create that connection. If we confront people with lots and lots of data and facts only, you know, that is hardly going to be effective. But if we can create an emotional cue, make it meaningful to their own lives, you know, make it relevant to them, um, show our own concerns and fears and so on, you know, then then we get there. Um, there's some research now that shows, you know, when scientists bombard people with facts, they appear, they perceive to be competent but cold. Yes. But when they're able to show themselves in the story and share their own feelings, you know, that's when we have trust. That's when we have warmth and connections with the audience. Yeah. And uh, I teach communication at a communication school here in Stockholm. And I always tell the students where there's no emotion, there's no connection. And where there's no connection, there's no commitment. So we have to get that commitment through emotion and connection. So a question to all the panelists, and if we can keep your answer to around one minute, that would be great. What have the last two years taught us during the COVID pandemic when it comes to communicating science? And how can we build more trust in science and research, especially climate science? And I'd love it if Jeffrey, if you could lead us off with this one. So what I have learned uh, for the past two years is that uh, people have become uh, interested uh, more on uh, science issues because of the COVID situation. Uh, people have come uh, to appreciate uh, the work of uh, scientists that they are doing. So um, I found out that, um, uh, that uh, for example, uh, everybody now is writing about uh, COVID. Everybody, everybody now is writing about uh, climate change, for example. So it is not like uh, what we used uh, to say that uh, uh, we have uh, just science journalists, you know, specifically writing about science. Uh, the climate change issue and the COVID issue has made nearly every, 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 uh, science journal, every journalist to be a science journalist. Yeah. So uh, for me, it has... Uh, you know, uh, made people, uh, you know, appreciate uh, the importance of science and uh, scientists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marina, your answer. One minute, please. Sure. So for me, the last two years almost felt like living through a live science communication experiment. And now everybody understands what it's all about because it's been put on a global center stage. Policymakers, research funders, uh, politicians, um, journalists, you know, everybody's now on the same page about the necessity of being able to communicate complex scientific content and data succinctly and in a way that is meaningful and relevant and comprehensible to diverse audiences. But of course, during COVID-19, we also saw many of the challenges and many of the wicked challenges, as mentioned by some of my colleagues today, coming to the fore. And my take-home message to scientists would be, and to science communicators and, and people in this field is, become part of the conversation. Collectively, we can make a difference. If scientists uh, shy away from social media and, and hide in their offices and labs, you know, the anti-science voices, the, the misinformation uh, and conspiracy theorists will become dominant. I think scientists owe it to the public um, in, in whatever way works for them. And not everybody can be um, in front of the cameras, but there are different ways. And there are so many ways to engage. So my message to scientists would be to that we've learned through COVID-19, look at the diversity of ways. If you find your niche, find your voice and become a part of that conversation to speak up for science, to help people to dis distinguish between misinformation and, and you know, trustable, credible information. We really owe it to society going forward with the climate change that um, challenges that we are facing yes. yes we certainly do Rebecca your answer please thank you um I think for me there's three focus areas um it's around embracing empathy so how are we going to be more inclusive and accessible in our approaches and make sure that we're telling everyone's story around embracing uncertainty how do we think about how to explain uncertainty, especially in cases where findings contradict each other, which we found a lot 
during COVID, that there were mixed stories. Um, and then the third is very much around embracing simplicity. So how we become more conscious as scientists of our cognitive blind spots um, as academics as well, and how it's essential for us to make sure that messages are clear and concise for our audiences. Yeah, conflicting information, a big challenge during the COVID, for sure. Uh, Johannes, the final word goes to you. Thank you. What a pressure. Um, I think I, I use the final word to echo something that both Rebecca and Marina has has mentioned about. I mean, one of the big learning outcomes, I think, for me during the pandemic was that uh, um, really, really good communicators, they were very humble and uh, and uh, open when they when there's uncertainty. Um, and there was a lot of uncertainty uncertainty during Corona. Um, but you could clearly see that also the only way of managing this was being honest about it, because it could be that three months later, something, some new findings came and then if you were super, super confident about your first statement three, month, three months earlier, it might be that you would have to say, oh, actually, this was not true. And that is part of the scientific pro progress, actually, to always say, yeah, we have new information now, and now we have to adapt. And you're only going to sound trustworthy if you're, if you're honest from the beginning that yep. we don't know. Yep. Fantastic. Really great insights. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but many thanks to our panelists, Johannes Ernstberia, Jeffrey Kamadi, Marina Jobert, and Rebecca Ilunga. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this discussion. And once again, we extend our sincere thanks to the Grunfoss Foundation for their support today. And we'd like to thank you too for your participation and interest in World Water Week. Thank you.